Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the Soldiers of Cinema podcast. I'm Clark Coffey, and with me, as always, is my trusted, reliable, amazing co-host, Cullen McFader. What's up, Cullen? <laughs> I'm good. I'm, I'm even better now after the, the nice adjectives. <laughs> I, you know, that's my goal, man. I mean, I, you know, I, when I go back and uh, not that I go back and listen to our old episodes, but, uh, you know, obviously when I'm editing, right. And there's, you know, we've got a few episodes in the can, you know, uh, just for all of our listeners there, a little inside baseball, but you know, we've got a few episodes of the can and so we'll record them and then it might be a while before I go back and edit them. Right. And, uh, it's always interesting to listen to it, like how we introduce each other, right? So I just had this thought. I was like, you know, I just like, I really want to, I just want to like overwhelm Cullen with some oh, yeah, like, nice warm fuzzies <laughs> in our introduction. And, you know, for everybody else out there, try that. Like pick somebody today and just compliment them, you know? <laughs> <laughs> just make sure yeah. you're sincere. And I am sincere. But uh, in all seriousness, it's great to be back. Uh, with you and in this episode we are going to be discussing Die Hard right in time for Christmas because yes it is a Christmas movie mm -hmm. yeah yes do you agree I, you I agree sound psyched. Yeah. Are, you, are, are, are you sad for Christmas are you sad no for Die there's Hard, many controversies or? about the uh the oh. conversation about it but I agree oh I think okay uh, so so you can't like uh you can't just like open your heart up to it like a <laughs> an uninhibited celebration of the fact that Die Hard is a Christmas movie because I, I can tell that you're torn. Okay, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. It's we're gonna even get a to political all... issue here. It's a po whoa. The Prime Minister has actually declared it a Christmas issue, so who knows? Okay, a Christmas it's issue? dividing people up now. <laughs> okay, well, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. But, you know, but before we do, and this is going to be like a, a little bit different maybe. I mean, I don't know. We always talk about a, a bunch of random stuff kind of in the beginning, but... But usually we jump into the movie that we're discussing pretty quickly. But we're one of the things that I want to I want to chat with you about in this episode is writing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think like periodically we kind of insert some discussion on like our experiences as filmmakers. Um, I mean, we've had a, a couple episodes that where you've talked very specific. I mean, the entire episode was kind of sp specifically discussing your creative process in one of the features that you've uh, made. Um, you know, so periodically we do this, but I, the, and the reason that I want to talk about this, cause I've had a super, a super interesting experience, um, in a writing class recently. And, and I really be interested to hear your thoughts on this and your experiences on this. Um, you know, maybe for all of us, I don't know, uh, maybe there's some people out there just seem to be like great at like every aspect of the filmmaking process. But my hunch is that the vast majority of us, there's at least like one area it just like it just like see it's like almost overwhelmingly challenging or something I, it, and for me that's writing mm -hmm. and the thing that's so wacky is that like that's the thing that i absolutely need to do right it's like i am in other words i'm totally compelled to do it i feel like it's under like i can't sidestep it like i must do this mm -hmm. but it's it's the thing that i am most scared of so it's like the thing i most need to do and I am most terrified and scared of it, right? Mm -hmm. No, that yeah, that takes <laughs> total sense. Yeah, total sense. Yeah, and, and and I'm sure there's you know, and for other people it could be other thing, you know. But but that's my personal experience. So, like having right, and it's like you know, I'll sit down to write, and and maybe I'll have like a couple months of like pretty good progress, but then I inevitably get like stuck somewhere along the line, and it's like stuck, stuck, stuck to the point where it's like I, I just don't completed i mean i literally have thousands of pages of writing mm -hmm. on my little computer here if i were to print them out It'd be thousands of pages mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and there's not one script in there out of all of that that i'm like i i love this i want to go make this into a movie mm -hmm. and there's nothing holding me back from making a movie except for the fact that i don't have a script <laughs> that yeah, i want to exactly. make into a movie yeah. right so so this has been like big struggle. So I decided, I was like, you know, uh, UCLA has uh, an extension course and UCLA has a, a pretty darn good reputation for their film writing classes mm -hmm. and uh, for their film pr pr department programs. And so they had, they've got an extension program where they have like a series of feature film writing classes. And I thought, you know what, what, what the heck, man, I'm just going to take one of these. I'll take the first one in the series. 
and see if I can just pick up, you know, because it's like, I mean, I'm sure you have too, right? There's just a million books out there. There's just a ton of content, right? I mean, mm -hmm. there's yeah, a it can be gazillion. Hard to kind of like synthesize it into. It's super, useful. it's overwhelming. It's yeah. overwhelming, right? There's, you know, Save the Cat, blah, blah, blah. I mean, all these books and there's a million YouTube channels and, and a million. I mean, it's just, it's, yeah, my head wants to explode just sitting here even talking about it. So I thought, well, maybe if I just take a class, you know, where it's like, yes, it's online, but it's like in real time, you know, we all show up. It's like 12 students. We're on Zoom. And, you know, it's like every week, like three hours a week. It'll help me kind of focus, right? Mm -hmm. And there'll actually be like a, an experienced human being, you know, there teaching that can ask questions, you know, in real time too, yeah, It'll keep you to a schedule and stuff like that too. Keeps you to a helpful. schedule yeah. and, and it'll hold me accountable, right? Because there's actually a grade, you have assignments, you know, every week there's an, a writing assignment you have to turn in and, you know. So, so it's like, okay, let's do this. And uh, so I sign up for the class and I start taking it and... To, to right off the bat, man, I'm, I'm loving it, dude. Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know, I, I the teacher is great, um, and I, I'm like kind of hesitant to get into super details because it's like, I, you know, I don't know if this person wants to be discussed, you know, in public. But uh, so I'll respect their privacy, right? But suffice it to say, it's like this. This I thought the uh, teacher is really good. Uh, this is a, like a, an actual, you know, writer who's written, you know, major studio feature films have, you know, been produced. His scripts have been turned into <laughs> major studio feature films. He's here in LA, he's in the industry and um, he's got experience and that was intriguing to me. Um, but, you know, right off the bat, um, there's these fun exercises, right? I'll give you a couple examples of some of the writing, ex writing exercises we did. So, uh, one of the writing uh, exercises was just um, to describe a landscape, and um, but you're going to do it like three times, and you're doing it the, in, from the perspective of a different emotional mindset, right? So mm -hmm. maybe the first one was something, something to the effect of, you know, describe a, a landscape from the perspective of like a, a person who's just lost their child in a war, okay? Mm -hmm. And then the second one was like, right, you know, describe that exact same landscape, but from the perspective point of view of, you know, someone who just, you know, fell in love, right? And then the, I think the third one was something like describe a, a landscape from the perspective of like an animal or something even. And totally loved it, like jumped right in, no hesitation, no procrastination, no fear, jumped right in, had a blast. Mm -hmm. and, and I was happy with my work. Another, ep another exercise was um, eavesdrop on some people talking without them <laughs> knowing and get like three, four pages of quote unquote dialogue from this eavesdropping and come back home with it and tr turn that whole conversation, like translate that into each person or character only being able to use three words at a time to like express their thoughts. Okay, yeah. So it's just like an interesting exercise, right? And and then after you do that, okay, now go back to that original eavesdropped, you know, what you've transcribed, right? The original eave, eavesdropped conversation. And now write it in the voice of David Mamet. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay, interesting. Yeah. And, and that was super fun. I loved it. Like, I lost myself in this exercise. I had a total blast with this exercise. Like, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't scared. I wasn't... I didn't procrastinate. I wasn't worried. I had a blast and I was, and I was really satisfied with my writing. I really, it's, you know, the whole process, the process and the outcome, I was totally happy and satisfied with. Mm -hmm. So we're doing all these exercises like this, right? And then uh, we get kind of further into the class and now we're getting to the nitty gritty and they're like, okay, uh, we get to this, uh, to the point where we have, we have an outline for the script that we're kind of working on, right? So the idea is that through through the series of classes, you end up, the result is that you have a full length feature script at the right, end of all right. this, okay? Yeah. So you're almost kind of like workshop, workshopping a script. Since this is the first class, they kind of start off with a few exercises to warm you up kind of thing. So we get to the part where we have an outline. We're supposed to have an outline. And in the class, uh, the teacher presents like a, an example outline. And I think it maybe was taken from like Pixar or something. Some, you know, 
but but ext- it's like very much like if the you know uh, this happens then this happens you know it's like the whole I mean it's like as structured as you can imagine it right mm-hmm. obviously it's three act but it's like here's your inciting incident and then this happens and then this happens and here's your midpoint and then here's your you know da 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 right all the way through and I totally tense up I totally freeze mm-hmm. I'm totally uncomfortable and I start to try to like take this ideas that I have for my script because I have I do and by this point I have a lot of ideas about characters and, and and themes and I have scenes in my head and I've got I've got a lot of pieces here and I completely freeze up and what I, I realize this is what happens to me all the time mm-hmm and I've read, you know, all these books that everybody says you're supposed to read, right? It's all of these, like, structure books, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You probably have too, right? I'm sure you have. Have you? Oh, yeah, yeah. I've gone you've through, been down this yeah, path probably, yourself. Yeah. Yep, yep. And every time I get to this point, it doesn't work for me. And I start thinking, like, what's wrong with me? Mm-hmm. Maybe I'm just not a writer. Yeah, Maybe like I'm just not. The syndrome sets in. Yeah. I'm just not, well, it's not even, I'm not even posing, man. It's just like straight up. Like I'm not good at, I must not be good at this. I just must not be a good writer. So it's weird is that everything else I'm writing, I love the process and I'm happy with what I'm producing. Mm -hmm. I get to this point and I freeze up, I tense up, I'm uncomfortable. It's not fun. That's a big thing. It becomes not fun. Mm -hmm. And it's not like, oh, I can't figure out what happens in, in Act 3 for the client, you know, and that's why. No, no, no. I mean, it's like this visceral, almost physical, negative repulsion from taking my ideas and f- forcing them into this very linear style of processing. And I, I think I might have finally kind of got some clarity on this for myself. Now, maybe there are other people. Here's why I want to bring all this up is because mm-hmm. maybe there are some other people out there listening who has had similar situations. And maybe, Cullen, you have. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I, want, mm-hmm. I know I'm doing all the talking here. And sorry, I apologize for that, everybody. But I want to get the story out in detail. And then I want to hear about, like, you know, if this resonates with you. And if so, kind of how, Cullen. Mm-hmm. So... So I start, you know, because this has been kind of a, 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 an issue just in general, right? It's like my process, I, I, I just, I can't seem to fit what feels intuitively right for me from a process perspective into what everybody seems to keep telling me mm-hmm. is the way that you should be doing this. Well, since everybody seems to be telling me that this is the way that you should be doing this, I just assume something's wrong with me. Yeah. And that basically it's like, well, I'm just not good at this. I just don't know what I'm doing. And so through kind of some strange combination of events, this kind of like sort of coincidental. So I had this experience in class and it's really causing me to think about this again, right? It's like, I'm really kind of what's going on here. Why am I having this response? Gee, what does this mean? And something, I I don't even remember exactly how, but I, I mean, you know, I was having a conversation with somebody else entirely outside of this. And we're talking about personality types, okay? Mm-hmm. And for the, like, I, if you're kind of for people who may or may not be familiar, there's like a, there's a personality typing test called the Myers-Briggs that's been around for a long time. And it kind of, um, it, it, it's a very popular test. It's been around a long time. And I think it has value to it. Now, of course, there's no test that can kind of like, it's not that this is the alpha omega of, you know, but it's just a little lens through which you can kind of see yourself maybe mm-hmm. and, and maybe illuminate some aspect of, of yourself. And in this case, of, of a creative process and maybe some challenges you're having. So I was talking about this personality stuff and I went back and I remember having like taken this when I was like my, one of my employers a long time ago had me take it. Like mm-hmm. the official mm-hmm. Myers-Briggs, like it wasn't online. It was like this official thing. It was like their HR department was doing it. And I got my results back. So I went and I remembered what those results were. So I went back and I was like, I wonder if this like says anything about what's going on here. And you and I talked about this briefly before because I wanted to know your personality type. So Mm -hmm. when I get this back, so I'm an, I'm a, so the way it breaks down is there's like four kind of like uh, traits that they kind of break down that you could kind of fall into these different things. And I'll just kind of go through it real quick. So the first category is that are you an extrovert or an introvert? And 
uh, and I popped up as an introvert. Mm -hmm. I think, Colin, you did too, right, when you told me that you popped up as an introvert. Then the second category is, are you a censor? Which means, are you somebody that kind of uh, uses your eyes, your ears, your, your kind of uses your senses to kind of perceive the world and you focus on kind of the facts and the details of what's actually really around you in the mm-hmm. world. And then the, the flip side of that is that you could be intuitive, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which is what you and I are. And that means that you kind of focus on like what could be maybe as opposed to what is, Mm -hmm. where you focus on the big picture and and patterns instead of- See the forest through the trees. Yeah, yeah, so it's all, yeah, exactly. So it's almost like sensors maybe focus on the trees and the intuitives kind of focus on the forest. That's a really good way to put it, dude, yeah. And then the next category is, are you a thinker or a feeler? And you and I fall into the feeling. Mm -hmm. And the thinkers are people who are like, logical and you know analytical kind of objectively way pros and cons this kind of thing and feelers kind of tend to be which like the name implies like kind of sensitive and kind of base decisions on kind of your personal values and kind of how you feel it, it'll affect you or other people around you mm-hmm. and then the final and this is where you and i are different is that there are either judges or perceivers mm-hmm. And you're a super judgmental person. So yeah, of fun. course. <laughs> it's just, it, judges tend to be like, and, of course, and everything's on a kind of scale, right? Everything's like on a sliding kind of curve. You know, mm-hmm. these aren't like binary in the way that they seem. But judges are people that tend to be kind of more organized and prepared, stick to plans. And perceivers are people that generally are a little more open. They like, Or they like to keep their options open, rather. doesn't mean that mm-hmm. they're necessarily more open. But you like to, you know, keep your options open and maybe a little more spontaneous and a little bit more flexible. So I, so I'm an INFP and you're an INFJ. Mm -hmm. Well, and I started kind of just using that as a lens through which to try to understand what's going on here. And I mean, basically, long story short, I feel like, oh, the other interesting thing is this, this is key. So apparently for you know they keep track of everybody who takes these tests right and apparently the percentage of people in the population i guess they kind of you know extrapolate to the population at large from their sample sizes but roughly ish infps make up about four percent of the population about four percent of the population and infjs which you are i think are even less I th- if I'm not mistaken, you might even be like one and a half to two percent. Yeah, I think it says it's the at least on this thing that I yeah. took, it was like the rarest personality type. So, so the point is, is that the way you and I are likely to perceive or kind of interpret the world could be pretty different than mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the the kind you know the, the majority of what's out there. And again, it, it's not better, it's not worse, it's not. That all of these personality types have have places and strengths and weaknesses and everything else. So it's not about oh, it's rare. So that means no. It's just it, there's no value statement on any of it. It's just it's a tool to kind of understand your own self. Mm-hmm. But I kind of you know, and and so I started delving into that world. And I think like maybe for the first time in my life, this has been a long story to kind of get down to a pretty simple kind of thing here, which I think maybe a lot of people figure out for themselves a lot sooner than maybe I am, is that it's just is just none of this process that is generally discussed and and taught and all these books and everything else that just don't work Mm -hmm. they just don't work for this personality type and i'm have you found that for yourself too i'm curious yeah i mean i it's not only with just these books but even like i like school and things like i i've always found it really like doing school and university and things like that. Like, of course I left, I was in university. I left. Um, yeah. And I always was wondering sort of why, because I was always very interested in learning and I like, mm-hmm. I like super curious learning new things and, yep. and things like that, but, but could never really get my mind on that. Like the way that you learn in, yeah. you know, like a, a institutional setting kind of thing. Uh, right. Uh, but even with like creative work, um, very similarly to kind of what, you've been describing where it's like you can write a script in this you know laid out kind of structured way Mm -hmm. that is or or even just brainstorming like there's there's structures to brainstorming and how people teach how to come up with ideas and things like that and um i find like that stuff has just never resonated with me and and it's really always just been kind of up to you know my feeling of of like i can 
get a lot of work done in a single night because I'm really, really, you know, passionate about something or I have like this spark of creativity and then not mm -hmm. work on something for months afterwards. And even just in terms of like the actual content of that writing, um, I vary so much from being wanting to do something sort of formalistic and narrative driven to something experimental and, and yeah. sort of like it goes way back and forth. So it's always been really, really impossible for me to, and I, I don't even mean that lightly, like very, yeah. very, very difficult for me to yeah. even think about in terms of like a career. Um, mm. Like I've never really wanted to be a screenwriter as a career or, or primarily yeah. a writer. Like I've wanted to write my own things, but never write for other people. And that's that where I'm at too. Yeah, um, me too. And, I think one of those, re like one of the main reasons that I was never, despite the fact that I do somewhat enjoy writing and I actually enjoy getting my ideas down and, and fleshing those things out, is just because I've never been able to fit into that sort of, like if I were to do this as a job, I don't think I would, I don't think I'd be able to do it. Um, writing yeah. specifically, of course, filmmaking is how well, I tend to make a living, but, but writing specifically can be one of those things that because it's, especially with screenwriting is so technical, um, that I've always found it, yeah, it's, it's difficult to like, you know, fall into those, for lack of a better term, like workplace kind of systems. Yeah. That, to, that, to fall yeah. to fall in line, to fall yeah. in line with the way the rest of the world is. Well, mm -hmm. I mean, it, you know, it's interesting to me that, you know, just to remind viewers out there that you and I met because we were taking a class on Werner Herzog. Yes. Yeah. And I, th I, I have a hunch, I mean, at least for me, I won't speak for you, but, you know, I think one of the things that really speak to me about his films is that they kind of click into my brain. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. they, I, I, I see that non linearness mm -hmm. in his films and this just this intuitiveness with which he's making his films and with which he's, you know, he's, he's writing them and shooting them. And they seem just so very intuitive to me. Yeah. And they seem yeah. kind of the antithesis of this formulaic way of, of creating. And that's the and, same and, thing with, with, I would say like even Terrence Malick, who I would probably sure. say is, is my favorite director yeah. if not like the one that's inspired me the most is very mm -hmm. similar in that sense of like where it's it seems very intuitive and i've heard people say that it's it's painful to work with him because of how intuitive he is but i'm always like that sounds like a, a dream scenario to, to yeah. work in that way well it sounds like i mean you know it's so interesting because it's like i think there's this conception where it's like oh you know, you're talking about a creative process mm -hmm. so when you're talking about a creative process i, I mean I, just the word creative i imagine like oh well there must be like all this room then to just do like yeah. what you feel right that's like my interpretation but in the reality like you and i both know it's like that's that's not the way the vast majority of the world is processing this like even mm -hmm. though it's a creative endeavor it's like in this class it's like everybody here is smart and, and and like really smart and and creative still like and and talented and all these things but it's like i can so tell the difference in kind of where my brain is at with most other people because it's just like it's like this very linear, like A to B to C, like even though it's a creative process, it's like very, it feels at least like, you know, when you read these books, like Save the Cat or Story, you know, all these, whatever it's, and, and it's all like very analytical, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Even though they're describing a creative process, mm -hmm. it's also analytical. And, and it's like, what I've realized is like, I just can't function that way. Yeah, That's well, just actually, not a, one other yeah. thing too I'll add is 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 in terms of like the end result too. I find that I very frequently when I whether it's a short or a feature, um, or even just a script that I finished, that I like I really like to leave things up to interpretation. Yeah, I really like to present an idea and not present a a answer to it or or just yeah. ask a question and let that kind of sit. And I find that like a lot of the notes, not all of them, but but a lot of the feedback that I've gotten on my work that has been sort of critical of it has been like, like I can't figure out what it's saying or like, <laughs> like it's not telling me anything. It's yeah, not like yeah. giving me answers. It seems to be unsure of where it wants. And it's like, no, that's not like, that's the what point I'm trying to do. It's the point is exactly that's the, the point. point is to, <laughs> is to ask these questions. And so I do and like, even when I remember when we were doing last temptation of Christ mm -hmm. and one of the things that I found really interesting in the commentary to that was Scorsese talking about how he wanted to have a conversation with an audience and present them with questions rather than answers yeah. so that people would continue that conversation as they left the theater. And I, that really clicked for me as well, where I was like, that, that is, that yeah. puts it into words for me, that kind of this, this desire.
Yeah, and, and I guess that's you know, and uh, we're already you know twenty six minutes in here, and and hopefully I hope this has been like helpful or interesting to to our audience, you know, as, as people in their own uh, finding their way through their own creative processes and everything. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, for me, so much of I'm I'm I, my hope at least like I'm writing to explore is the goal. Mm -hmm. And and it sounds like that's what you're you know it's like I'm writing to explore not to like to ask not to answer and and specifically when I sit down to, to write a story I mean I, my I'm having fun when I don't know how it's going to end so to so the idea of like outlining a script and and having this preconceived notion of like exactly how this is going to wrap up mm -hmm. and exactly how these story arcs are going to go and this kind of thing is. To, to me now again it's like this is not i'm not suggesting that that is not just as valid a way to create again it's about just matching process with oh, exactly. your temperament and personality yeah. so i just yeah. want to make sure that's clear so this is not me knocking another way of working that might work great for you guys out there um this is my just our, my own personal journey but you know it it's like i i want to write to the point where my brain just kind of shuts off or it feels mm -hmm. like my analytical self is shutting off and it's just the characters are t kind of taking over yes yeah and i'm surprised by what's happening mm -hmm. and so th the story may go in a way that may very much just kind of be uh, the logic of it might be very dreamlike it may not be like it it might not be linear or rational mm -hmm. in like that really truest sense and um and I, I, it's so weird to say this, but it's like, and I, I'm so old <laughs> to just kind of be finally kind of getting to a place where I'm confident and comfortable mm -hmm. about my own process. And it's like, it's okay if that's what you do. Oh, yeah. And I I've, mean, I, I always <laughs> felt like, like kind of uh, like I was doing the wrong thing because I always hear even like from famous screenwriters, famous directors to, to friends of mine who also work in film or write or things like that, where it's like this, one of the things that always got to me was the, I'm going to put every scene on a cue card and lay them out on my floor. And I was like, I could not, like, I could mm. never relate to that. I was like, I can't either. Like, and I've tried it because I was like, too. oh, cl clearly that's how you do you it. You and I have tried it together. You yeah. and I have oh, tried yes. it together. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we did. Yeah. Uh, and that's yeah. the thing. And it's so weird how, like, for many of us, obviously not everyone, but for many of us, it's like, it's really I, when the whole world seems to be saying this other way is the way to do it. Mm -hmm. It's very and, and from the earliest age, right, that's kind of most of or all of what you've heard. I guess that's why it can be so challenging to finally come to a place where you're like, hey, like my way of doing it is OK, too. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that could just be really challenging to embrace. But I feel like this class in a very roundabout way, as I described, I think was so instrumental in helping me finally realize that. And, and you know, and the other thing I, I want to segue to a little bit before we get on to um, Die Hard, and we will, I promise, we'll get on to Die Hard, is I'm curious for you, like for me, my like the very tangible kind of like my physical space, my keyboard, my state of mind, like those things are so important mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in kind of, allowing that process to happen because it, it, it's, it's such like an intuitive and kind of feeling process for me that all of these little things really matter. I'm curious, like for you, if that's the case, like even like my keyboard, like I've got oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> like this super yeah. special keyboard that's like, tac you know, for a tactile sense feels good. Or if like, like I, I'm too tired or if I'm like overly wired or if there's other things like you know, in my space, that's like, like, I could be very easily distracted, for mm -hmm. example, you know, mm -hmm. like, I'm just curious, you know, because uh, obviously, now we're kind of moving from maybe like a more kind of like philosophical space to kind of a more just logistical space, but I think they can be so connected. Mm -hmm. I mean, for you, what are the say, like, what are some of these, like, some tricks of the trade that you've kind of learned to help your writing experience along? I think like removing any, I mean, removing distractions is such a basic huge statement, yeah. but, but I think so that huge. like even doing something like disconnecting from the internet and like, yeah. or like I, I remember one of the most focus mode, creatively fulfilling weeks of my life was when I was on, a, on an island in Thailand that had no internet connection, no electricity, no running water. Like it was, and no I running water. <laughs> suddenly my, yeah, you had to flush the toilet with a bucket. Um, but okay. suddenly the, the I've entire been there. like 
I was shooting a movie at the time and like the entire for lack of a better term thesis of the film like came to me while I was in this space because there was just like my brain was just so stimulated by just being in in like a place that I had no connection to mm. the outside world and and even more specific than that just again no distraction to be looking at the news every day or to just be like watching you know mindless stuff online yeah. or whatever and, and it yeah do so you definitely... have so that's interesting for me i feel like i prefer kind of like my safe space right i feel right. like when i'm in a new space it's harder and maybe i could like try that more but like when i'm traveling i tend to kind of want to like be present in this new place that i'm in mm -hmm. as opposed to kind of hide myself away and write now maybe ideas come but actually oh yeah as, like, yeah i wasn't writing at this point well I, I barely wrote the movie anyway but i was it was more just yeah like the inspiration the creative inspiration gotcha came to me so much easier um, sure without those other distractions things like that like even just walking around in the jungle or like on a beach or something right. it was like very very I, um, yeah, yeah totally see that but when it actually comes to like getting the words out on i'm like i have my space i have mm -hmm. my office mm -hmm. you know it's like okay here's my safe space i don't want anybody around yeah. It's like, even if do my you wife write is... to music or do you usually, so sometimes, mm -hmm. so sometimes I will, uh, it depends. There, there will be like kind of long stretches when I, I, I just get into it and I'm kind of in a flow and I don't have music other times. Um, I'll, I'll just, I, maybe I'll have like a very specific th vibe that I'm going for in a scene. And mm -hmm. so I'll try to find a piece of music that I feel like kind of gets me emotionally in that vibe. Sometimes I'll just have it on kind of like a rando kind of playlist kind of thing going mm -hmm. to try to because because i don't know what kind of vibe i want yet and so i'm just looking for something that clicks but sometimes that can lead me a little astray because i can spend more time kind of going through music than i do writing so yeah. i would say yeah. i would say it kind of depends um it kind of depends and you know i think a lot of people have um and again, this goes back to like, well, what what do a lot of people say versus what works for you? A lot of people, you'll hear like, hey, you know, you have to sit down, same time, every day, same amount of time, da 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 da, get it in. That doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. That 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 does not work for mm -hmm. me. Yeah, no, and, not at and, all. And, um, it's not that I feel like, oh my gosh, I have to be just you know struck by lightning to sit down at the computer. But I do have to feel like I have. To, and again, I feel like this does go to that intuitive kind of feeling way that people like you and I process our our environment and our thoughts and feeling is like it's through our feelings. And it's through our intu like our t intuitive experience of things is kind of like how we're processing stuff. And so for me, it's it's it can kind of ebb and flow. Right. And maybe it's like 9 a.m. one day. Maybe it's like 9 p.m. the next day. Or maybe 3 I skip 30 a, in the morning. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe I skip maybe I skip a week mm -hmm. and then I'm writing like eight hours a day. Yeah. It, it, it It's just it, and I, I feel that 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 feeling is so important. And, and my hunch is that, you know, it probably is for a lot of people. And I, I think this is a good time to bring up um, a really interesting like energy drink. Mm -hmm. that yeah. um yeah that i've been exposed to recently so i don't know if i had never heard of this before but when i checked it out apparently it's like all over the place i don't know if you'd ever heard of it mm -hmm. but there's this energy it's kind of like it's a shot it comes in like a two ounce shot it's called it's uh, magic mind and the good people there reached out to us and they let us try some and so i've been trying these little two ounce shots of this uh and i don't even know if energy drink would actually be like the 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 technically like you know best way to describe this because i feel like it's a little bit more than that but i'm going to get to that um so for me it's like i wake up and i i'm not a super huge morning person right i don't know if you are but i am not a morning mm -hmm. person yeah, me yeah. yeah but but here's the thing i really dislike coffee like i i have never been able i have never developed a like a palate or an appreciation for the taste of coffee Mm -hmm. Now, I like what it does for me, but I hate the taste of it. Right. Yeah, yeah. I just never, and I know it's like huge, like people are at Starbucks or wherever all over the place and people pay a lot of money for this, like super fancy coffee making machines and stuff. I, I mean, I've supposedly had like some of the best coffee in the world. People have these super expensive machines and, and I just, I don't, anyway, don't like it, mm -hmm. but I like what it does for me. 
And so now I'm kind of like, you know, stuck with like, well, what are these alternatives? Like these, like, you know, Monster or Rockstar or these kind of, you know, energy drinks that are like way, for me, way overly caffeinated. Mm-hmm. Like way too much, and uh, there's a ton of um, like fake sweeteners and stuff in there, yeah. Yeah. and I've just it and it's 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 just not I don't know it's just it's like it's, jet fuel. <laughs> it, it, well, yeah, but yeah, like in a bad way, I feel yeah. like yeah, exactly, and it kind of tastes like it too, to be mm-hmm. honest. It kind of tastes like jet fuel, so I was like super curious to try these little two ounce drinks out, and one of the things that really um, I was like. I was like, okay, I'm super curious about this, is that I feel like it's like perfectly caffeinated. So again, it's like there's, I I like some caffeine, but I, I cannot tolerate too much. Mm-hmm. So if I'm like kind of under caffeinated when I wake up and I, I, I'm trying to sit down to write, it's just a non-starter for me. Mm-hmm. But if I have too much caffeine, it's almost like, the, it, it's like I can't sit down. I can't focus I'm, I, and mostly, and I feel anxious, which is really an absolute non-starter for being creative for yeah. me. Yeah. I cannot create if I feel anxious. That's just no go. So, um, so yeah, so they reach out to us, and I've been trying these little guys daily for a few days, and I have to say, like, I'm pretty impressed. For me, it's the perfect amount of caffeine. And here's the thing, too. So in, instead of these other energy drinks where the caffeine kind of comes from, I, I think it's just like purely synthetic. It's like mm-hmm. just pure caffeine they're adding to these drinks. So this caffeine actually comes from matcha tea. And um, I think what's cool about that is that it's actually kind of like, it's like a time release, I guess, so to speak, or like an extended release. Mm-hmm. Like way to, like del- hit you up front, yeah. way to deliver caffeine. So not as a, not only is it like a really good amount, or I think kind of like a sweet spot amount of caffeine, but it actually has kind of a time release effect. So it's not hitting you all at once and kind of overwhelming you and then it's gone in an hour. And so I, yeah, I was like really impressed. Um, I feel like it's the right amount of energy and it's got like a really nice kind of like profile of how long that lasts and kind of like how it hits and how you feel it. Um, and we, I just wanted to share that here with our viewers and our viewers, our listeners. And, um, and I also wanted to share too that it's, it's now available at your local Sprouts to try. So I highly recommend go check this out. And if you like it, we actually have a discount offer here for you. So if you go to magicmind.com slash soldiers of cinema, so again, that's magicmind.com slash soldiers of cinema, and you use the code cinema20, you'll get a 20% discount for one-time purchases and up to 50% off if you apply it to a subscription. So I highly recommend that you guys check this out. Mm -hmm. Um, I have really been enjoying it. Your reaction has kind of made me want to try them because I find that, like, I, I don't mind the taste of coffee, and I like, I will drink espresso sometimes or drink yeah. tea. I don't um, like espresso but, either. It's so weird. Yeah, well, espresso is, yeah. I, if you don't like coffee, that's understandable, yeah. But um, but I, I've, I, what my issue is kind of, interestingly, is sort of like the opposite of yours, where I actually find that the caffeine in those things doesn't ever really affect me that very much like i, I always mm. find that like and i think maybe i just have a, an immunity to it or something like that but because of the fact that there's also so many other things in this i, I do i am curious to know um when i get a chance i'd love to try one out so i mean there there are there are so there's not just matcha in this mm-hmm. which which ha, which does contain that caffeine that you're going to get uh in that kind of extended time release that we talked about but yeah there's also ashwagandha uh some lion's mane mushrooms and some other things so yeah uh hopefully we can find a way to get some of those out there to you in canada mm-hmm. i we can talk to the magic mind people and see yeah uh, but if you're here in the united states like i said uh available at your local sprouts and also available online and uh, for our listeners with a discount. So magicmind.com slash soldiers of cinema, code cinema20. And we will also have that information in our episode notes. Okay, so on to Die Hard. We thank you one and all and wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. It's Christmas Eve in L.A. But a team of terrorists. You want money? What kind of terrorists are you? Who said we were terrorists? 
have their own holiday plans. And I'm telling you, you're just gonna have to kill me. Okay. We do it the hard way. But the one thing they didn't plan on was New York cop John McLean. Got invited to the Christmas party by mistake. Who knew? You really think you have a chance against us, Mr. Cowboy? yippee ki mother... I want and you'll have it. They have already killed one hostage. This channel is reserved for emergency calls only. Lady, do I sound like I'm ordered a pizza? Come to Papa, honey. Are you really an American? Only if New Jersey counts. What does he think he's doing? <laughs> Good job. They're using artillery on us. You appear to you, Mr. Police. It's him. <laughs> He's an easy guy to like. Welcome to the party, pal. And a hard man to kill. Bruce Willis. Die Hard. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> Now this that is we're all my half pick. Made it up. <laughs> then you're all yeah. This, this is this is my pick, and I, I thought it would be fun to talk about this movie here at Christmas time. Now we've already talked about how that's a little bit of a controversial thing, mm -hmm. but <laughs> and we're going to get to that too. But mostly because you know, I it, it 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 was on my radar because of Christmas. But what I'm really interested about is you know this is one of the first like action films that I remember I was 12 when it was released now I didn't go see this at the theater I remember seeing this like on TV yeah cable you know uh, probably it would have been like two years later or something but I remember this or maybe I saw it on VHS I, I'm not sure which one but I mean it was huge I, at least in my mind right in my 12 year old mind it was like oh my gosh die hard this is the most amazing thing ever and and I was intrigued by like what action was mm -hmm. in 1988 and what action cinema is today and kind of how maybe that's changed. Has it been for the better? Has it been for the worse? Maybe a little bit of both, but that was kind of like the initial question or curiosity that I had. And I hadn't seen it in a while. So I'm curious, you know, what, again, like, I, I always love kind of like seeing films through your eyes, you know, generation younger. So I'm curious what your thoughts are. But, you know, for me, this film, and for, I think for many people of my generation, this film kind of represents the zenith of action cinema mm -hmm. from that era. And we're going to, I think, talk about why. But so I'm curious when you first saw this, how old you were, what your thoughts are when you saw it and kind of what your thoughts are now. I, I genuinely, I do not remember the first time I saw this. I think it's one of those movies that was always playing on like spike TV. And so I think I, or like AMC or something like I would always just come in to like, or turn on the TV at some point during the day. And it would be partway through Die Hard because I do mm -hmm. have very distinct memories of, of, mm like seeing this as a like probably oh, wow. too young like i was probably like seven or eight the first yeah, time i okay. saw like pieces of it okay um, and i remember my dad probably being like oh no this is too violent for you despite the fact that he showed me like, <laughs> which my parents never out. said yeah. yeah my my parents never said that by the way <laughs> i think he still let me watch it anyway because i saw a lot of a lot of stuff as a kid but um yeah. but i do specifically like this is a movie that i have a distinct memory of of being told that it was violent uh -huh. so again i can't quite remember the context of it but i i do remember so um, it was like precious like I, I, for you i don't know it why had a I, reputation I remember there being the part when he runs across the broken glass i distinctly remember there being a commercial break right after that oh so that, is, that is very <laughs> stuck in my brain um now my dad also is one of those people who staunchly thinks that this isn't a christmas movie so um ah. a joke one year i got it for him like the blu-ray it was like a four pack actually of yeah all four of the first ones. i've got i've got um, it yeah i've got that yeah <laughs> for, for a christmas I, uh -huh. I got him that and so i love it um it is kind of his classic thing i haven't seen it i don't think in a few years i think it's probably been maybe five or six years since i last watched it um but i've always liked it like it's always been a really exciting you know action movie and 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 i think i'm just trying to think about like i, I want to see if i can think about the first time i saw it because i i 
feel like. But again, it's just it's like a mix and mash of of different DV viewings. I think that I yeah um, that I saw it. And I definitely know that like the first time I sat down and watched it all the way through was probably in early middle school. Like I was probably in grade six or seven at okay. that point. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, and yeah, I just I don't know. I think I remember like being very, you know, as a as a young man, <laughs> being very into the like visceral action and the blood and the you sure know, lots of the sure the violence and it was very exciting and things like that and so uh-huh. um yeah i i i i can't give a very again very specific but, recollection of my first time but but i do okay. know that this has been a, quite a consistent movie for me through my through my life so okay so now your most re- recent viewing mm-hmm. what were your thoughts and i mean it, it, and you haven't really said like do you like it did you not like i mean not not explicit Mm-hmm. But it sounds no. Like I definitely, you did. yeah, I definitely okay. do like it. Yeah, yeah it's okay. definitely a, a. It's always been something that I've like. I, I have never, not wanted to watch this when it's <laughs> been put on or anything like that. Um, I sound, very specific. Never I sound like I'm like avoiding talking about how I like I know. it. I know. You're like. Uh, I mean, I, I, I've I do never actually not, genuinely enjoy. <laughs> I, I've never not. Like I'm like in a legal disliked, proceeding or something, and I have to. I've never not disliked the liking. <laughs> of this film <laughs> it's like um, but no i do like i do i do genuinely like i i do enjoy the movie um and i i think this time was interesting because i think i was like again it's probably been six or so years since i last saw it yeah if i'm guessing correctly i could have seen it more recently than that because it has been something that i've pretty consistently watched at christmas as well um so i might just be misremembering but um yeah i think that the this time specifically i was i was interested in like a lot of the i don't know it's like one of those times when you you kind of rewatch a movie that you haven't seen in a few years and like all these technical elements kind of start popping out at you mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. like for example another christmas movie that i always watch is scrooged with bill murray oh yeah i love and that and i remember like I one that. time watching that and because like, i've i've watched that all the time as a kid like yeah you know like that's like a christmas eve tradition where like uh with my mom we always watch it that's awesome and um similarly to this i remember watching it kind of after I had started making movies and all of these really interesting technical aspects kind of sort of popping out at me there. And so I think I had sort of a similar experience with this where for the first time, not maybe for the first time, but definitely was like, oh, that's a really interesting way to compose that shot or shoot this scene or um, the actual like structure of the film and how it kind of tells the story and how there's actually, it's, I actually was surprised this time too, that it's not until halfway through the movie that the like, big terrorism plot really kicks off mm-hmm. uh, or or robbery well, i suppose is the I, so so yeah well I, I mean but even to like to 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 extend that a little mm-hmm. it's not until 20 minutes in that we have really any action at all yeah yeah and I, I mean i think this is you know we can kind of start here i mean this is one of the places that i think really distinguishes this film from so many action films today for the most mm-hmm. part by and large um and, and this is going to kind of build into a theory. I, I have a theory that I want to share with everybody. I don't know if it's a, it's a theory, but it's what I call <laughs> it. I've named I've named a, a syndrome that I feel like modern action movies suffer from. And this is part of it. We're going to get to it. But I call it the Pepsi challenge syndrome. And I've got to explain this. Mm-hmm. But uh, I don't you you may be too young. I don't know. But you have probably heard of like the Pepsi challenge, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You heard of it? Okay. I think so. So for everybody else out there, so way back in the day when I was a kid, right, Coke and Pepsi. Coke and Pepsi. Like, which sugar water do you want? Yes. Big money. And there was a, and Pepsi had this campaign where they did blind, supposedly. I I think they probably really Oh, yes, I have done this. I actually have done this. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to say they didn't do it. They did. Not supposedly. I don't know why I said supposedly. They did. You know, sure. Like, give them the benefit of the doubt. This is honest. Honest. So they Mm -hmm. went out and they did blind taste tests. They put some Pepsi in a cup with no label. They put some Coke in a cup with no label, and they give it to people on the street or wherever the heck they are, right? Mm-hmm. I have and done this, kind of, yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and so people would just take a sip. So somebody would stand there off the street, sip of the one, sip of the two. Which one do you like best? And they'd be like, I like number one. You know, oh, it's Pepsi. Okay. So the point is, and so, but this, this gets interesting, though. So Pepsi would win on average, on these taste tests. More people would say they preferred a sip of Pepsi to a sip of Coke. Mm -hmm. And so Pepsi went nuts with this ad campaign. More people choose Pepsi. A blind taste test. More people choose. But Coke always outsold Pepsi and kept Mm -hmm. outselling Pepsi. People would go into a store, they'd buy Coke, not Pepsi. 
And there's the old Why? classic complaint about when a restaurant has, says, is Pepsi okay? And you're like, no. Yeah, no, not. I like, won't even the... eat. I won't even eat somewhere yeah. if they have Pepsi. I'm just, but that, <laughs> I don't, hey, Pepsi, if you want to sponsor us, I'll change. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's totally not true. Um, but, um, but, but so the, so, you know, but so here's the thing in these taste tests, these blind taste tests, people keep saying we love Pepsi better. Pepsi's better. Pepsi's better. But people mm-hmm. buy more Coke, buy more Coke, buy more Coke. Why? Well, what they found out, so they actually dug into this. So Pepsi is sweeter than Coke. Now, mm-hmm. they're both. I mean, I don't even know how you can tell one's sweeter than the other because all they are is sugar and carbonated water. But yeah. <laughs> apparently, Pepsi is sweeter than Coke. And with, when, when someone takes a little tiny sip of something that's sweeter, their kind of knee jerk is like, oh, that's better. Mm-hmm. But it's based on a sip. Mm-hmm. If you're going to drink a whole 12 ounces of something, there's like a threshold of how much sweet you can tolerate. Yeah, yeah. And so when it comes to actually sitting down and pouring a whole glass of something and drinking it over a period of time, it's Coke. Mm -hmm. That's what people actually want. And so I feel like modern action films, looking at you, Marvel, kind of fall into this Pepsi challenge syndrome thing Mm -hmm. where it's like too much just action all the time. Mm-hmm. And and yeah. even within the action, the biggest thing is actually not like maybe it's not even that there's just action all the time, but it's that when there is action, it's freaking overwhelming. Yeah, there is like so much crap it's happening. Like sensory overload yeah. on screen all the time. It's like the whole you. We've talked about this. It's like the whole world is exploding and aliens from it. You know, it's just like it's like everything has to be bigger, has to be bigger, has to be bigger, has to be bigger. Mm-hmm. And I'm and so I've labeled this. This is my own invention. I call this the Pepsi Challenge Syndrome. So it, it, at least you know. And you argue with me on this. Tell me you don't buy it. Whatever. Like I, you know, it's open for debate. But I feel like this partially can explain why I think Die Hard has held up mm-hmm. over time, even even in like a head-on-head competition with a modern action film, is because they take time to set things up. They mm-hmm. set up characters. We know who they are. There's these great. That's the other thing too. There's really McTiernan. McTiernan does a McTiernan. I always want to put an M. Yeah, in there J- John McTiernan. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why I always want to put an M. I want to say yeah, McTiernan, yeah. but it's not. It is kind of an odd. Yeah. Like, it's McTiernan. McTiernan. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, it, it, he's kind of the king of '80s action. Um, mm-hmm. But I feel and even like, made fun of that in Last Action Hero, of course. And even made fun yeah. of that in that, where, where he did kind of get a little bit of his own Pepsi Challenge syndrome going on, mm-hmm. might I add, and it was not successful. But, but the, the the taking the time in that yeah. first act to develop characters and to and and to do have so many little setups. There's so many little setups that pay off in this film, mm-hmm. and even within the film, there's action and there's like relief. There's comic relief. There's, you know, dramatic relief um, from the action. There's there's a dynamic range that actually exists in this film. And I know a lot of modern action films try to kind of replicate this dynamic range as well, but I just feel like they, there's not nearly enough mm-hmm. dynamic range in action films today. So I know I, I completely agree. I actually I think it's interesting that you've brought that up because i think that even even within like i'm not a i think we've spoken about this at length but i'm not a big superhero fan any yeah. like, period like I, i've never really been super into it but growing up and, and still to this day i actually really enjoyed the sam raimi spider-man movies i always thought that those were yeah. kind of and and it's funny because a lot of the times what people talk about with those and why i think the second one spider-man 2 is kind of still like talked about as the greatest superhero yeah. movie of all time is because there's like a good 45 to 50 minute chunk in that movie where where there's no act like Peter mm-hmm. Parker is not Spider-Man he loses his powers and he just goes about day-to-day yeah. stuff and like his life is falling apart and well, it's all character stuff. We've talked and about it's this exactly yeah, the yeah. same yep. thing here where you get like there are great action set pieces in this. Yes. But they are all sure. in service of They're John McClane getting yep. to a point, having to do something, completing a task um you know like the of course the setup of the movie is this guy has no shoes he's got nothing except for his pistol like his well, service pistol and he's running through the building and it's like he has to essentially figure out how am i going to take down let's go back further than that know. 
we, we there's this great there's a there's like it's it's a masterclass in economical story setup. Oh yes, right? yeah. Like yeah. we start like right off the bat, we know he doesn't like flying. He's mm -hmm. like nervous about flying. We know he's a cop, and I know yeah, easy, easy, easy. But this is all done like very economically, often visually. Mm -hmm. Exposition is told in a way that it doesn't feel a lot like exposition. You know, he sits in the front of the taxi. marriage issues too. Yeah. Right? We we set up that he's he's still married to but estranged to his wife. She's moved mm -hmm. out here to pursue a career. He's left in in New York because he's dedicated to his job. Right? And and maybe we have a little bit of you know maybe he's an older style dude and. Maybe he's threatened by his wife's success, which is kind of implied a little bit. But, you know, so there's some depth there even. And I think mm -hmm. this started to happen to a lot of men in the 80s. Um, so there's some depth. But we we set up this, like, relationship with the taxi driver, the limo driver, and he has his moment. He's some, some comic relief through the film, but he also has mm -hmm. a dramatic, heroic moment that pays off in the end. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we set up all of this. We set up that he's... He's far from perfectly capable. He he's frustrated with himself. He is, you know, estranged from his wife. He's failed her. Well, even just in the politics of the time, too, right? Like he's he's a New York cop, yeah, a, like gristled New York street cop, in sarcastic, the perfect, like you know, pearly white. Oh, it's LA, right. Well, and even in this building, right? He's in mm -hmm. Nakatomi Plaza, and he's in this like beautiful, like foil wallpaper, you know, suite, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's an office building, and it looks like a fancy hotel room, you yeah, know. Yeah, they got the I mean, waterfall feature and all that, yeah. <laughs> right? But I mean, um, and uh, you know, and here he is, like a wife beater, like you say. And they, there's this fun setup, you know. It's like the guy in the plane at the beginning is like during the credit sequence is like, get, you know, when you get to where you're going, take off your shoes and you know, make mm -hmm. fist with your feet on the carpet. And you're thinking at the time, and I love these kind of setups. And the thing is, they're not hard to do. They're so not hard to do. But so many films don't take the time to do this, and I don't mm -hmm. know why. But it, you know, and you're thinking at the time, well, that's a weird line of dialogue. Like this seems kind of out of left field. Like this is weird. Who the hell would say this on a plane? And then you, you know, you get to the, you know, he's actually at his wife's place of work at Nakatomi Plaza. He's there, kind of getting freshened up for the party. He's got his shoes off in the bathroom. He's sitting on the pot. He's like making fist with his feet. Mm -hmm. He's like, oh god, that actually works. Holy crap, mm -hmm. that really works. And then of course it plays out. It, you know, it pays off even further when we get to the, the shoot out the glass mm -hmm. at, which is like one of the standout sequences in the film that everybody loves. It sticks in everybody's mind. I mean, you even you, they, Hey, whoever edited that commercial break did a perfect job. Cause they knew like you were going to be right there to watch that commercial, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but, but I just love all these little setups, the watch we're going to get to it, but you know how, um, you know, she doesn't want to, she, she doesn't want to talk about the Rolex that she got, you know, with her mm -hmm. husband when, they, when they first kind of meet and introducing her boss to him and everything. And of course the watch is what ends up, you know, sending uh Gruber to his uh, death uh, yes. at yeah. the end of the film. So I don't know. I love these setups. I love the time that the film takes before it gets into action mode. And I love the dynamic range that the film has. Mm -hmm. Um, every character has a payoff which I think is really nice. And, you know, it's, we've got, uh, this is horrible. I'm going to forget the character's name, but you know, his, his, it's almost like a buddy cop movie too, which yeah, yeah, he's like a little liaison below. People yeah. actually like, and I don't think a lot of people talk about this, but this is actually a buddy cop movie. It just mm -hmm. so happens that one cop is on the scene stuck in the mm -hmm. building and the other cop is outside on the radio helping remotely. Mm -hmm. yeah moral support you know and, and of course in the end saves his life which is what people don't focus on that so much mm -hmm. which i'm kind of surprised by but like i feel like that's such a that's so beautiful um okay anyway i keep i'm going on and on um but uh so these are some of the things now you talked about colin and i want to hear a little bit more about this we were briefly talking about this before um mm -hmm. you were talking about how you felt like this film kind of lacked an like a cynicism that you feel like is in modern action films. well that's that's Tell the other thing too that. is like I've, I've i've always found that a lot of modern like studio action films have this 
bizarre and i don't even know how to describe it like it's like a i think that one thing is that that movie stars are basically brands at this point like they're not Mm -hmm. movie stars and so it's like you're not going to see a dwayne johnson movie where he's playing a character you're going to see a movie where dwayne johnson is in a a situation or ryan reynolds or whoever it is they're brands exactly exactly and so they're not people because of that and it's not limited to those two. Those are just two examples yep. that I think have been talked about recently. But because yep. of that, what you end up with is um, if this was made today with the exact same script, you'd have, like, let's say Ryan Reynolds, you know, as, as a brought up example, was playing John McClane. Mm-hmm. And he's running through and he's got his glass. He'd be like, oh, that's great. I've got glass in my feet now. Like, there's this <laughs> kind of, like, bizarre... <laughs> irony to it all where it's like they have wait, to wait 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 can i just it, stop you for a second that i that i that this is my favorite moment <laughs> and, and and i i just thank you for that that was i just love that <laughs> that was but brilliant. no it's okay. it's really like it's really it frustrates me because i find that it's almost like the creators like the writers and the directors and the cast of these movies are like worried to be sincere Yes, and they're worried yes, to take things yes. seriously because yeah. it's like I don't know if it's like they think that their high school bullies are gonna like message them and be like, "Well, you are is, sincere, ha ha." Dis- and so there's they- a detachment. You're so mm-hmm. right. There's a, a, a there's a detachment, and I think I think you're right. It, it it's so much more than just okay, you know, the the modern action films kind of they don't take time, and of course some do. We're speaking in generalities. I mean, there's mm-hmm. always a lot of exceptions. So I don't. Oh you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. But but we kind of t- you know, or that the action is so big, but it was with, without an emotional attachment. I think this is a, what you just mentioned is it really speaks to that. It's that there's this. It's like wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Yeah, I'm like in a, like I'm in a movie. Acknowledging the audience almost like it's I'm almost in a big, movie. Yeah. This is a movie. So it's like, and and I feel like this all speaks to this bit, this like postmodernism, you know, or almost mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. meta meta modernism. This like we all know it's a movie we all know i'm an actor we all know that when i grab the you know beer out of the fridge it's an advertisement and so i'm gonna even probably link for it the actor's own beer brand for the actor's <laughs> own alcohol brand yeah. and so everything is kind of this wink wink nudge nudge inside joke tongue in cheek you're right and so right. where does that leave us as an audience where that leaves us is zero emotional attachment that's where that leaves us because the the characters we're supposed to be relating and empathizing to are literally breaking the fourth wall over and over again to remind us they don't care mm-hmm. so why should we and it's also i think it's it's really you, you have to be very specific with it too yeah because there are certainly funny little lines that that uh, john mcclain says yes yeah. but and they're all n- in character and that's the difference right yeah, they're and it's all not in like he's not sarcastic and yeah and it's it's like it's like a it's like a tension release it's yes. not a, yes it's not a um like it's not like him being like you know like oh like what is this situation i've gotten myself into this time well, it's, it's not him like saying a, this doesn't matter exactly it's him exactly. saying like holy crap that was a close call mm-hmm. Ki- kind of and it, my character would would to crack to alleviate the tension i feel right now yeah crack a joke or swear at yep. the guy on the ground like the fbi totally. guys or whatever right and so it's i think that that's another thing that it's a great whenever point. this is brought up people will go like well there's always been comic relief in movies but it's it's the meta fourth wall breaking yeah um great ignore, point, I, I think one of the yeah. reasons i do bring up brian reynolds specifically too is because he he was in a michael bay movie not too long ago i think it was called six no. underground and it totally not that again not that michael bay is like a the a groundbreakingly a brilliant filmmaker or anything like that but i think one thing that always has worked in michael bay's favor is that all of his characters take the movies that they're in seriously right like right. that there is still you know love the movies or hate the movies the characters are still in there taking it seriously and, and responding i mean to, to the, the point of melodrama action. for his older exactly. films absolutely at least. absolutely yeah. um and but the one with Ryan Reynolds is funny because you have all these crazy Michael Bay action set pieces, explosions, mm. car crashes, and things like that. And mm-hmm. he, it'll like cut to him in the car, like almost looking at the camera, being like, yeah. "Wow, like how did I?" Like it almost feels yeah. like you have to have like a record scratch and be like, a, "I like didn't a audition. How I got here? I didn't audition for this film. How did I get yeah. cast?" Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. I think that that, and again, not to just you know crib on uh, uh, Ryan Reynolds, but I think that he's a really 
good example of that no, he, just because yeah. you 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 see the difference where it's like there are some funny bits in Die Hard. Absolutely. There's some and For sure. they are There's funny. great comedy. Yeah. And yet they all feel like they naturally fit into the setting of the film and yeah. the tone of the film and, completely. And, and even let's be honest, I mean it's even like to the point of slapstick. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Like a yeah. lot of time. I mean it's not that even the comedy is subtle or that it's like I mean it you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, like ho ho ho, I've got a machine gun or mm-hmm. I mean it but it's all it it all goes with the emotional flow as opposed to denies the emotional flow of the situation. And you know what, too, is that you never, again, like I, I, I'll i reiterate this, but slightly differently, too, like cause just because you brought up the ho-ho-ho thing. To me, what that says about John McClane is that he's kind of scared shitless and he's like, okay, well, I got to just like <laughs> relieve my own stress. I'm going to make yeah, a, yeah, a joke yeah, about yeah, this. Yeah. And it's we, not, we and all it's do not this. like he's just like completely calm about it and being like, I'm going to tease them for fun. Yeah. Like it's like, he's like, how do I scare the hell out of these guys and make them think that I'm a much bigger threat than I actually appear to be because I'm one guy with no shoes on. Um, totally. And so it, it really, and it tells you again, it tells you a lot about him as a character too, that like it's, it's, it's not him looking at the bright side. It's him just scraping together any sort of, Anything that he can, anything out of desperation, yeah. Um, and so I find that that is a really, really key difference I mean, between you know these things. Yeah, it's like when you're staring into the abyss, right? The existential, you know, <laughs> like the end that we will all face. I mean, you're yeah. left with only one option, really, which is to laugh. <laughs> yeah. It's like yeah. what else exactly. can you do? I, and I, I you know, and so I do think that, like, and I think that Willis plays that perfectly. I think that, yeah. like, even it's not. And you know what else? another perfect example of that is like Alan Rickman as, as Hans Gruber. You don't get this point where like, um, yeah, we got to talk Bruce about Willis says a stupid line to him Gruber. or something, or like says a one liner to him over the radio. And then Hans Gruber looks at everyone else and sort of goes like, did he really just say that to me? And it's like this kind of character breaking, like, Oh, I'm acknowledging how stupid that is. He just, every time Bruce Willis or uh, John McClane tries something in this movie, he tries to like get under his skin Alan Rickman, or I keep saying their actors' names, Hans Gruber is is pissed, but he's pissed in a like scary way that makes him a a very formidable villain in this. I mean, um, can we just talk about that point for a second? Because I think you know we talk about Bruce, and you know we talk about comedy, and you know mm-hmm. uh, obviously it's you know Bruce's history up to this point. I think he was mostly known for Moonlighting. I think would be how most people would have known him. You know, television actor, and it was tough to go from television to film back then. Now, of mm-hmm. course, people are doing the reverse of that because well it's a whole different story but um you know and so this is in 88 so we've you know we have schwarzenegger St- stallone we have this is like the height of big muscle bound dudes as heroes mm-hmm. so i think that's the other thing too, i just want to briefly touch on is that you know bruce coming from a comedic perspective and and a little bit more of an everyman as opposed to a superman I think was key, but yeah, let's let's get to Alan Rickman because mm-hmm. you know I, I think this is his first major feature film performance and launched him into stardom. I mean, boy, does he crush it, right? I think yeah. he went from like a you know theater he was performing to play to mm-hmm. this, and I, I, if I'm not mistaken, I don't want to speak out of school, but I think he was about forty when he landed mm-hmm. this role, and I mean, boy, does he crush it. I mean, it's I feel like you know in any good film, right? It's it, it's the the better the bad guy, the better the film, right? The mm-hmm. better the hero, and Hans Gruber is just it makes this film, in my opinion. I mean, I used to <laughs> I used to joke to my wife that if we ever had a son, like we had to name him Hans Gruber. I don't know what it is about that name. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's so great. It's, it's like such it's a like great if you put, name. Uh, if you just asked like an AI generator for like a German name. For a bad Out comes guy, Hans Gruber. Hans yeah. Gruber. It's just, yeah. it's just, it's like It'll the be like perfect. Werner Herzog's cousin or something. You know? I mean, a rose by any <laughs> other name, right? Yeah, it's just brilliant. But, he, but I mean, it's Alan Rickman's performance, right? That I yeah. that imbues that. It's like shorthand. I'm saying, holy crap! What an amazing performance! What an amazing antagonist! Mm-hmm. What a, gr- you know, just all around wonderful. And one of the things that I think is actually really a brilliant change, because of course this is based off of a book. Um, yes. Is is that is that they change the motivation from pure terrorism, which is, is in the book yeah. to robbery. And I think yep. that that, the reason they did that was to lighten the film for sure. But I think it actually really works out in its favor because what it does is it makes these 
like it, it it makes the 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 you know villainous thieves so much more distasteful because you're kind of thinking like oh you're not you're not even doing this for like anything other than and that's kind of what um yeah it's kind of what they say multiple uh, times wife says yeah she's like she's like you're not even like terrorists you're just doing like you're just no no good criminals yeah or no good thieves and and so you get this like i think that that actually even if if the only real you know motivation to do that was to kind of light make it a little bit light less heavy the subject matter um that it actually does work in the favor of the 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 film in itself because it does kind of make this whole character of hans gruber also so much more intriguing like when he does the whole thing about you know i want to release the like front of liberation yep. Quebec, um and all these terrorists like around the world who, have, who are imprisoned and you just kind of get again like the movie itself isn't cynical but the character is like he's so yeah. cynically just being like i'm gonna spin all this stuff yep, and, yep. and just you know waste their time so that we can just get away with this money and go sit on a beach somewhere um, yeah and so it's like one of these rare cases where i think that the simplification of the stakes and the simplification of a character's motivation and the, the villain's motivation here actually works in the favor of the film just because of how it's handled it's it's actually just done so well that it really works out in the uh the favor of the, the film you know, that makes it, yeah. You're making me think about, you know, that's interesting. It, you think about how the film itself is not cynical, but yet we have some, like, very interestingly cynical characters, and look what happens to them. You know, in, mm-hmm. in a, you, you, one could, one could potentially even make an argument that this is, like, an anti-cynical film, that the film mm-hmm. is actually very specifically commenting against cynicism. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just talked about how Hans Gruber is, you know, frankly, an epitome of cynicism. But look at like, I mean, then you've got um, uh, William Atherton, who plays that uh, TV reporter. Mm -hmm. I mean, have you ever seen like, have you ever seen a more cynical, like slimy character? Yeah. In a film. He reminds me so much of, um, well, is that not him in Ghostbusters 2? Yeah, I think so. Yep. I I think you're right. And I mean, he's so good at that, just that kind of like uh yes ugh, oh character God, yeah. i i mean i don't even, it's not even that i have a word for it it's like a sound it's like a visceral like ugh, you yeah you know and he's we've so all met great. someone like him <laughs> and it's so great in this role but i mean and, and i just love that he gets his in the end so we've got that great setup but i mean you could almost argue that this film is actually like anti-cynical right it's like mm-hmm. yeah so so that's 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 a really interesting point um but yeah i mean i think all the way around i mean each one of the the crew each one of Gruber's crew, I think, it, it, this is the other thing that really works well in this film, is that each each character, that not, not every single person in the crew, but there's like a handful mm-hmm. that have an important role to play in the story. They really stand out. They have unique personalities. They have unique looks. They have a unique role. And, and they're not just like cannon fodder, mm-hmm. which I think is really important. And works yeah. really well in the film because a lot of films back then. I mean, that's kind of you know, it's just like generic bad guy number three. You know, it's just oh yeah, yeah. Like they like all you, have names. They all they all have like different reactions to and roles. The, yeah, you know. Yeah. Yep. 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 And it's just yeah. So I I mean it's there's so many things I think that make the film stand out. But I I, I want to touch on it. I know this is like really your area of expertise too. And we haven't touched on it yet. Uh, is Jean de Bont's cinematography yeah so that's that's one thing that i actually find really interesting about this because there is i think as you get into the 80s not that there was like certainly movies are still very stylized at this point and and, Mm. you know to a degree they always have been but you actually what i find interesting about this era of of like filmmaking is that you get a little bit more standardized with the looks of large budget like studio movies. And mm-hmm. I think a lot of the reason to that is because, you know, you had the seventies new wave and all that. Right. And um, you're out of the new Hollywood era. By the, yeah, yeah. By the eighties, you have the studios kind of regaining that yep. control from the, the sure. crazy directors. Um, Those wacky so directors spending all of our it, money. Yeah. So the movie, actually, I think that the movie looks great. Like I think that John DeMont does a fantastic job. It's anamorphic. Yep. There's a lot of like, I flares, think that one of my favorite flares, things about flares, the, flares. the flares in this movie and actually of this era is that, so often today you get this kind of like jj abrams is kind of the biggest name in this idea but yeah, 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 where yeah. you're like specifically shooting light into the lens to flare it and you're flaring it and flaring it whereas the flares here actually seem a lot more incidental which i like 
is that it's just like, oh, there's a light there, and the, the lens brushes past it quickly. And so you I mean, just let's get, like, be a honest. Bit of, let's be honest. I'm it's sure it's on those, purpose. Yeah, but, but it just it, it looks it's good. It's hidden a lot more <laughs> well. It's like it's it's um. Well, and they're dirty, and I think that's yeah, the big, like exactly. You, these are these are they're using old lenses, and I, I I'm not sure quite what, but I do remember. I hearing, would guess C series C series would be my guess, like Panavision C series lenses. I, 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 I I'm not I, I'm pretty sure they're Panavision. They're definitely an older series of lens, and so they're like you get some dirty flare. I mean, I don't know if, if how other like actual cinematographers would call it, but they just seem. You know, you mentioned J.J. Abrams, and I mean, it, it almost seems like his are like digitally inserted. And actually, well, he actually shines a light. He has yeah. a flashlight, and he shines yeah. it into. Um, yeah, and, and so, so I get what you're saying. Uh, yeah, Panavision Ultra Speed Golden Lenses. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry, no, that's for the high speed shots. Let me just. Well, I can actually get this up real quick. Um, yeah. So they are. Yep, C series, C series, okay. and E series lenses. Okay. Okay. So, and I think those are older. Uh, I mean, even yeah. in the 80s when those were Those were, I shot. think, like late 60s when yeah. those were made. Yeah. And, 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 it, and so you're right. I think it does. And it gives it not just those, like, those, what I think the average kind of person might think of, those anamorphic flares, which are like those blue sh- shootouts. Like purely those, horizontal. Those horizontal. Yeah, yeah. This has, like, really beautiful haloing and... Mm-hmm you know, circular artifacting and which I think is pleasing. I feel like the 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 artifacting of these lenses, this flaring, um, has a more just aesthetically appealing. Now we're getting like super nerdy, but just uh, yeah, it does have a more aesthetically pleasing look in my opinion mm-hmm. than those really forced like a lot really of modern f- animals. Yeah. 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 Um you know it's no I do think it's interesting that yeah there's there's a little bit more of a standardization to one thing I want to in... talk about, I want to talk about this. So I, okay, oh, yeah, yeah. I, and I, I want to talk about this because if there's anybody, you're too young, but if there's anybody else that re, that remembers this, I, you know, if you're listening to this, okay, I have this memory. So I feel like when I was a kid, so, and this is probably like 1990 or something, right? And, and the, the Die Hard is on TV. And obviously TV back then, we're talking about, you know, 480, 4x3 four CRT, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. This is that what we're the looking same at. how I watched it too, yeah. <laughs> but I feel like, when I would watch that on television, or or it was VHS, and this is where I need help, I can't remember that that obviously it's going to be pan and scan. We get that it's you know for sure it's pan and scan, but I feel like there was some kind of error, like because it was shot anamorphic, it wasn't like de squeezed correctly. And I remember watching it when I was a kid multiple times, where I kept wondering why the hell does everybody look so strangely stretched? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that's actually so. A lot of times for there was actually kind of a choice that people would make sometimes between pan and, the scan and, okay. and just de- almost like de-squeezing a 235 image into 185 and then cropping that. And so you ha- you wouldn't have the full like two times I, de-squeeze. But I only remember with this film. Yeah. Now, obviously, yeah. like what you're saying. but And, and so I and was, it was wondering. It was quite if... commonly done for TV, though, like not necessarily VHS releases. But, yeah. Um, not, I wouldn't say common. Like it was actually Pan and Scan was much more common. But Yeah, Pan and Scan I was do, everywhere. I do you had know, to. Um, I've seen other movies that do that. And I do somewhat remember, I can't, I mean, I definitely saw this, like it was the same thing where it was 4x3. Mm-hmm. I mean, this would probably have been in the early 2000s. So 4x3 CRT um, and like, again, like Spike TV or AMC or something. But yeah, um, yeah I think that it was likely. It's hard to say because there are also like VHS tapes could do widescreen. Like you could have a widescreen. Yeah, you could have widescreen right? on VHS. Yeah. Um, Although it was rare until the end of the lifespan of VHS. Yes, and 4x3 TVs, of course, too. But I mean, you know, when I grew up, I mean, everything that was shot at any wider aspect ratio. So basically almost every film. Well, mm-hmm. you know, obviously there are many 4x3 or close to it films from earlier eras. That was, you know, the original uh, aspect ratio that was most common. But but it was very common to do a pan and scan, mm-hmm. but 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 you would still have a relatively like you know the image would not seem very distorted or distorted mm-hmm. at all. You would just lose I- image data from from the sides, right? And yeah. you, that hence the name pan and scan. You would have to like they would literally have to move back and forth and create totally artificial camera moves 
that looked horrible because they weren't mm -hmm. actually camera moves. It was the scanning system was like moving back and forth along the frame when they scanned yeah, it. Yeah, just cropping in essentially. Yeah. Cropping in. And, and But this was like, I, I just, this was the first time that I was like, why is this, why does everything look so weird? So yeah, yeah. it was almost like maybe it was one of my first exposures to like, well, wait a minute. Like, what is aspect ratio? What, you know, like what's going on here? What does anamorphic mean? So it was kind mm -hmm. of my first exposure to some of that a little bit um, where I noticed it, you know, as a kid. Um, mm -hmm. but I, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to, but so we're talking. No, about... I just, I just do think that it's interesting that you get this kind of, again, like this, this a little bit more like, like cinematography in the eighties, there were obviously exceptions, but, um, tended to be a little bit less experimental. Like it, yeah. it kind of found a, a niche again, because studios started getting a lot more control. And this was also a lot of like the, like less versus the late eighties and into the nineties was when you started to get larger non-film related corporations kind of owning studios and things like that and the heads of these studios kind of stopped being you know actual film producers or things like that of course there are there have been more recent examples of film producers yeah. running studios but um it was kind of the first time that you really started to see like a head of an electronics company come yeah, in and yeah, start yeah, running yeah, yeah. a studio or something like <laughs> Gee, that right yeah um and so i do find it interesting that you get again like you get this kind of a little bit more of a, a I mean, if you think about this and you think about something, again, for example, Ghostbusters, Back to the Future, um, uh, what's another, you know, late act, like even something like uh, uh, Last Crusade, for example, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, all of those movies look very different, but there's mm -hmm. a lot more of a consistency in kind of the stylistic approach to lighting and, mm -hmm. and like, especially color timing was a lot mm -hmm. more consistent at that point, mm -hmm. um, where like the film stocks were, were very, very specifically timed to get a specific color whereas yeah. there was a lot more experimentation with like contrast and color and uh different filtration and stuff like that in the late 60s or like up yeah. until pretty much the late 70s so i yeah. do find it interesting um yeah and it's not saying that this movie doesn't look good at all because i think it, it does i i actually like the look of a lot of movies in the 80s yeah um, but it is sort of a i just find it kind of like a little bit of an interesting historical tidbit is that like yeah. you can kind of see the evolution of the film industry in the look of these movies alone yeah um, well yeah and i think some of that is technical uh just in the you know maybe it has to do you know some with with studios kind of taking more control away from directors but i think also too is that you just have you know over time right it's like when a technology is a little bit newer there are you know there's a lot of experimentation there's a lot of different processes that are competing there's a lot of different technologies that are competing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so there's a lot of options and people are playing around with a lot of things but then over time right those uh, those technologies are kind of refined combined uh, technologies that weren't ex that weren't as successful or you know especially economically successful kind of fall away so the options become less right yeah it's, things sort of fall but, in place yeah. yeah and things kind of fall in place and so you know film stocks get refined process color processing gets refined you know mm -hmm. but it, there's just only so many cameras only so many lenses only so many film stocks you know and over time, you kind of you, things do kind of tend to technologies as they mature, mm -hmm. push towards less options. And so I think a lot of it has to do with that. But I would also say, I think, you know, by the time you get to the late 80s, 80s especially here and into the 90s, you've got this really wonderful sweet spot where you've got all of those technologies starting to become very mature and film stocks becoming very refined and cameras and lenses and you, I think you have you start to get this like beautiful epitome of what film can look like. Mm -hmm. And then, of oh, course, yeah. like yeah. we move a little bit further and we start to have digital takeover. And um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I really am often quite, uh, uh, quite pleased with like the look of this era of film. It's I mm -hmm. feel like this moving through the 90s is like a really sweet spot just from an image quality perspective. Oh, absolutely. On yeah. what film can. Yeah. And what film can look like. And it's wow. also like you have this point where where sound technology is also really really being, yeah yeah like really really well refined and so you get that really rich sound like you kind of don't have that like low pass sort of effect anymore where like the bass just wasn't very punchy yeah um, yep. like you get like really really wonderful foley and uh, like the gunshots get... all sound very very stark and yeah uh, poppy and things like that and so yeah. I mean, speaking of sound, let's talk a little bit about the music, mm -hmm. yeah. and and particularly, you know, I think I discussed with you briefly, but it's it's so again, I saw this when I was very young, so don't make 
fun of me for not knowing what Beethoven's Ninth was or the Ode to Joy. But I remember listening to this when I was a kid, and I just totally thought like, oh, you know, this is this is Christmas music. Ode to Joy mm-hmm. is Christmas music. <laughs> I just thought like I just oh me too for sure because yeah, I just yeah. totally I was like oh yeah this even is even like music. knowing now that it's not hearing that in this movie because it's kind of still, also mixed in with a few other like yep, Christmas yep, motifs totally. and things like yep, that. Yep, for sure. But it, I still to this day I'm just like while watching this i'm like yeah that's a christmas like i don't even it just kind of subconsciously passes into my brain as a christmas movie which is funny i know it it, well and so you know obviously the music is is a big part of why a certain contingency of people think this is a christmas music is of Mm -hmm. course because of the you know our christmas film is because of the christmas music but i i want to hear you know and but let's talk i mean a little bit more i mean the 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 um the composer of this film yeah, was Michael Kamen. Yeah. Michael Kamen. And I think, you know, more he than just... He did so many action movies in did, the 80s. He like, did so he did many. a James Bond movie, he did License to Kill. Highlander, I think, right? Um, Didn't he? Yeah, he did Highlander, he did Robin Hood, he did, uh, I think, the four, Roadhouse. Like, I think he did all three of the original Die Hards and then did even the, yeah. the 2007 No, this one. guy was pumping them out, man. I um, mean, he, he was doing Brazil, like three, four films a, a year. Weapon. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, he just did... So, so many. Last Action Hero, so clearly he worked with John McTiernan quite a bit. Yeah. Event Horizon. Like, I, I could go on and on and on. But really, yeah. I think for someone that isn't, like, an immediate, like, you know, everyone can name, like, John Williams or, sure. or Hans Zimmer or Ennio Morricone and things like that. Whereas for someone who's not quite, like, a household Another name, Hans. Those, those ones. Um, oh, yes, there you go. Um, <laughs> you get someone like Michael Kamen, who, again, may not be household like name much of in the vernacular of modern yep. culture but he i think did a massive amount of like so many so many 80s i really defined that sound actually in my opinion yeah um and i think inspired a lot of uh present day uh like composers and and, and the way music is moved, used because i like you hear even again to go off on a tangent for a second you hear his music for james bond and he took over right after John Barry, John Barry's last film, who had been the James Bond composer for mm-hmm. since the inception of the franchise, um, ended with uh, Living Daylights, which was Timothy Dalton's first film. And then, mm. and then Michael Kamen comes in and does License to Kill, and it is a completely new sound, like totally. Yeah. And I actually really like the sound of his. Like he kind of incorporates synthesizers, and he incorporates sort of an electronic sound to a lot of things. But at the same yeah. time, there's still like this orchestral feeling. Um, he uses guitar a lot, like like acoustic guitar, which I find interesting. Yeah. Um, like just as kind of almost like a, a little like letterhead for, or, or a little like moment. I can't remember what the word is specifically, like a, a cue, just a tiny little yeah. bit to like emphasize something. Yeah. Um, so no, I do, I do really like his score for this. Um, very distinct sound. And I mean, and, and I just want to point out to i mean and so just a couple other things i mean so yes he's done a ton of action films but a couple i just want to bring up two that uh, that really stood out to me and his work in them and uh one is 1994's don juan demarco which a lot mm-hmm. of people crap on um and i guess i can get it but i actually think it's a sweet film and it's got some really extraordinary acting talent in it brando's in that faye dunaway and johnny depp um a younger Johnny Depp, and um, mm-hmm. obviously 1994. I mean, how could he be older? Um, but <laughs> um, but I think the score in that film is actually really quite nice, and I would recommend just this as total aside, but if you've not seen that film, I do recommend it. And um, Mr. Holland's Opus was a little, that's, a, that's from 95. That one was a little saccharine for me. That's just a little bit cheesy. Um, but also What Dreams May Come, uh, he mm-hmm. actually did a few films with Robin Williams um, starring, but I think What Dreams May Come is really interesting. And then 2001's Band of Brothers, the miniseries, um, yes, yeah. has really got some beautiful music in that, and that's a, and that's really an extraordinary miniseries I would recommend as well. So, I mean, it's not just action films that he's, he's scored. He's done some dramatic work and even yeah. some comedic yeah. stuff, and um, I agree. I think it's, you know, it's a shame that he's not as well known. He's done some really wonderful work. So, okay, let's wrap this up. With the final question, mm-hmm. is it a Christmas film? I think it counts. I think it's about a, it's about a man on Christmas Eve trying to get back together with his family. So, boom! I would you say. know what, <laughs> Cullen? I couldn't have said it better myself. That I, 
I, I couldn't have said it better myself, and I totally am in agreement with you. All right. Well, on that note, everyone, uh, appreciate you all hanging in there for a little bit of an extra long episode mm -hmm. and a little bit of a, a divergence from kind of what we normally talk about. But I hope that you found kind of just our exploration of our own creative process interesting, I hope. Um, because really and truly, at the end of the day, that's what I think it's all about. And it's mm -hmm. a big part of why we discuss these films is to like better understand our own, like the creative process in general. And just like, it's such a huge part of the human condition. And it's like, it's, it's, it's such a huge part of the purpose of why we're here, I think. So mm -hmm. yeah. uh, it's, it's kind of why we discuss these films. And uh, so I hope that you found that helpful or interesting or, you know, uh, at the very least, not too terribly boring. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's the goal. Yeah. There you go. All right. Well, until next time. Um, if we don't, he if we don't, uh, if you don't hear from us before, uh, I'll just go ahead and cover the bases and say uh, happy holidays to mm -hmm. everyone. Uh, but hopefully, we will. You will hear from us uh, before then. But just in case, uh, happy holidays, everyone. We'll catch you on the flip side. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.